The session this morning is on population trends and translocations. I'm gonna speak first. I am Kathy Griffin. I'm the Sage Grouse Coordinator for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And then I'm gonna to have Tony Apa come up. He is a part of the research unit, the avian research unit at CPW. And he's gonna talk about translocations in the past. And then I'm gonna come back and talk about the potential for population, or excuse me, um, translocations in the future. So like I said, I, I know a lot of you have probably seen this slide. It's been around for many years. I think the first time I saw it, it was a Tony Apa slide. <laughs> um, but I wanna get everybody, especially the new people, kind of all at the same level. So here in Colorado, we have two species of sage grouse. We have the greater sage grouse here with the, um, the green polygons. The greater sage grouse is found in Northwestern Colorado and 11 other states and a small part of Canada. We estimate that here in Colorado, we have about 12,000 greater sage grouse. Today's focus is on Gunnison sage grouse, as you know. Gunnison sage grouse is found ma mainly only in the state of Colorado. We estimate about 3,500 individuals in Colorado. And there is a small population in Utah that we estimate has about maybe 10 to 15 birds. So both of these species require an expan um, expansive area of sagebrush. You might have heard the term sage, a sea of sage. And that's what all sage grouse species prefer. Um, the sage grouse is one of the few species that depends on sagebrush throughout not only the year but throughout its life. They use, they eat sagebrush throughout the year but in the winter it's particularly important not only for food but also cover. So I'm going to zoom in to just the Gunnison sage grouse range and you can see um, that we now have Utah on the on the uh, whoops sorry about that on the slide, and I'm gonna um, you're gonna see a lot of this slide in my talks, so I want to explain it a little bit. The blue areas are the Fish and Wildlife Service's occupied critical habitat. The red polygons are Fish and Wildlife Service unoccupied habitat. And as Leaf pointed out in his, one of his slides, that CPW has two other habitat categories that the Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't use. We use the same occupied range as the Fish and Wildlife Service critical occupied, that blue polygon. But we also have a vacant unknown category where we have currently suitable habitat but we have never found birds and we've never found sign of birds. But these are areas that might be really important for future treatments or perhaps translocations. We also have a category called potentially suitable. Now that category is where we have area where it was historically sagebrush, but is currently not suitable habitat, not suitable sagebrush. And these areas are gonna require um, potentially a lot of treatments in order to bring that habitat back. So you can see the differences between there's these areas here that are CPW categories, but not Fish and Wildlife Service categories. So Gunnison Basin, I'm going to put hopefully some pictures to some of Witt's words. Gunnison Basin is our largest population, about 88% of our birds occur in Gunnison Basin. It, was, it will be referred to as our source population when we're talking about translocations. Next we have the Pinion Mesa population where we find about 3.5% of our birds. The San Miguel population where we have about 7% of our birds and then Crawford where we have just under 1% of our birds currently. In the past, it's been a larger population. 
These are circled in green because that ties back to Witt's talk about these are populations where the recovery plan has a specific criteria for a population level at, that um, is needed for recovery of the species or delisting of the species. So these are the populations that have that population target. The remaining populations, we have Cerro Summit Sims, um, Dove Creek, Monticello, Utah, and over here, Poncha Pass. These populations all have less than 1% of our populations. Um, they do not have a population target in the recovery plan, but as Witt pointed out, they do have requirements for habitat acres and quality of habitat. One thing that's important to note as we go through the next two days is that the land ownership is across the range. It's about equal, a little bit more federal land than private. There's some state land in there. And this 42 to 54% division sounds pretty equitable across the range, but the reality is in each individual population is very different. For example, in Crawford, there's about 60% federal land, 40% private, whereas in Dove Creek, it's flipped. There's only about 10% federal land and 90% private. So the makeup of land ownership is a really important part of how we um, manage on that land and how we would potentially prioritize the treatments that other sessions are gonna talk about today. So we look at populations by population trends by doing LEC counts. In about 1996, CPW started um, conducting LEC counts to a particular protocol. We've maintained that same protocol over the years. So our counts are essentially comparable during that time frame. This protocol dictates the dates in which we count, March 15th to May 15th, the time of day in which we count, half hour before sunrise to an hour and a half after sunrise, and the number of times we count. The goal is to count each lek at least three times, preferably more, in the course of that three-month period. With these, um, what we're doing on these counts is we're counting how many males we see, and we get a high male count. We use that high male count to estimate population sizes. So these lek counts help us track population trends. Now, over the years, a lot of times, particularly in greater sage grouse, our effort has really increased in what the number of leks we're counting. Here's a graph of, well, I see a graph, of the uh, total lex, lex counted and total active lex. So uh, this is over time for about the last nine years. The red line, oops, the red line is the number of active lex that we are counting. It does not fluctuate much over the last nine or 10 years. We we're counting between 78, 75 and 78 active lex every year. On the other hand, the, number, the total number of lex counted has been going up slightly, this blue line, starting in about 2000, 2014 when the bird was listed. At that time, we wanted to make sure we weren't missing birds. So we have been spending more time looking for um, potential birds using historic lex or inactive lex. And to be honest, we've been spending a lot of time looking at these other category of lex, and we have not, if ever, found birds on those lex. So now I'm gonna go through a series of graphs, one for each population, but I'm gonna start out with all the populations, but they all have the same structure. The bottom is time starting with 1998, going to 2021, and the y-axis is the three-year average population estimate. We use the three-year average because that was what was determined in the 2005 range-wide conservation plan as a, um, the best metric for tracking these trends. So as you can see, the black line, that top line here, 
is our range-wide total. Just below that is Gunnison Basin. Again, it's Gunnison Basin that is really driving what our range-wide totals are, are. And all the satellite populations, all those other ones, are all these colorful lines down at the bottom. And obviously, they're an order of magnitude smaller in population size. Now, as I zoom in on these, you can see these are all the satellite populations. And you can see they fluctuate very similarly to the Gunnison Basin. The, about 2002, 2003, we had a very severe series of um, or years of drought. Also in 2008, 9, 11, 12, the start of these, this decline, we also experienced severe drought. And then in the last few years here, 2017, 18, 2020, 2021, we we're also experiencing drought. Interestingly, in 2019, we had a good precipitation year, but when that rain fell and how that rain fell was really rain slash snow was really important because although we had a lot of snow, we had problems with rain on snow events, which created um, an ice layer over the snow, which could impede the grouse from actually burrowing or from finding the sagebrush. And we also um, had a very, very late heavy snow in spring that could very easily have impacted the nesting grouse. So now diving into each population, this is the Gunnison Basin. It's the closest we have to a sea of sage. Um, the population obviously has been cycling like I just showed you. The green line is the Fish and Wildlife Service's population target for this species to, um, not to aid in, but to uh, potentially get the bird delisted so we are quite a bit under that. And as I go through these slides, they all have the same axes, but the scale on the Y axis is gonna change dramatically as I go down in population sizes for the satellite populations. So next we have San Miguel. You see that similar type of fluctuating population trend. The green line again is the Fish and Wildlife Service target for this population at about 300. San Miguel presents its own challenges and, and opportunities because as you can kind of see, well, the pointer's too close to the advance. Um, San Miguel population is actually made up of five smaller subpopulations. They're naturally fragmented by canyons where you have deep canyons and then mesas with sagebrush on the top. This creates a whole set of different problems with connectivity, potential movement for the birds, as well as habitat types. They're very, very different between each of these um, subpopulations. Um, there is a picture of Dry Creek Basin here, very, very dry habitat. And then we also have the Miramani, which has quite a bit of um, mesic habitat. Pinion Mesa is one of our higher elevations, and although it looks like there's a bit of sea of sage, um, it is surrounded by, again, red rock canyons, and you can see a lot of uh, oak brush and mountain, shri um, mountain shrub communities on the outskirts. There's also been quite a bit of um, pinion juniper encroachment. And again, Pinion Mesa has the Fish and Wildlife Service population target. Here we have Crawford. This population has been declining and has not shown the most recent upticks that our other satellite populations have shown. And that is um, something we're very concerned about. It's interesting to note that um, in 2021, our last count, we saw a total of three males, but it's that's not unprecedented. We also had this in 2000, um, I think it was 2011, we had a high male count of four. 
So back at that point, the population did come back up. Um, it's in these typical fluctuations, but it's not coming up and staying up, and that's one of the problems we're, we're having. Next, we have Poncha Pass. Sorry, it's not on the map. It's just east over here. Poncha Pass is an interesting place because it has very high quality habitat. It's got a lot of good winter habitat. It's got the summer or the nesting habitat, the summer brood rearing habitat, but it's very, very limited. It's at the top end of the San Luis Valley. It's got a highway running through the center of it, and there's a power line, a high voltage power line through the very good habitat. So we have had problems with uh, maintaining populations um, in the Poncha Pass area. If you can see this picture was taken by a Forest Service employee, Mitch Nutter, in 2019. It's a little difficult to see, but that's the way grouse are. There's a female mother grouse here, and she's followed by six chicks. This was taken in um, late August. So if these birds can just go a couple more months and survive, they're likely going to make it through the winter. And that might be just why some of this uptick occurred that we did have good, re um, good reproduction probably in 2019. This population also went to zero in 2013 and we did an emergency translocations in 2014, 2015, um, just to keep that population, hopefully to keep that population from becoming extirpated. Next, we have Cerro Summit Cimarron, Sims Mesa. And as the name implies, it's made up of three separate smaller populations in this area here. We have not had any birds or any sign of birds on Sims Mesa for over 10 years. It's probably been 12 years now. And um, just since 2019, we have not recorded any birds in Cimarron or Cerro Summit either. This area it has limited sagebrush habitat and it's very much surrounded by mountain shrub oak communities. And last, we have Dove Creek Monticello. We talk about these populations now as two separate populations, but even back in 2005, when we wrote the range-wide conservation plan, we considered them one population. We had evidence of movement at that time between these two, but since then we have not had any evidence of movement. Both populations have been declining rapidly. We talk about them as two populations now, mainly because, because Utah has its own uh, management style and management priorities compared to Colorado. So it's easier and there, there's different um, threats across that borders. And so it's easier for us to talk about them as separate because they have separate management implications. We have not counted any grouse in Dove Creek since 2016. And I think in Utah, we're down to four birds this year or last year, excuse me. The other difference with Dove Creek and Monticello compared to all the other satellite populations is it, there's a lot of CRP land as well as um, agricultural lands, mainly soybeans. So it's a different uh, issue than a lot of the other populations. So we, the big question is, especially with the listing, is are we missing birds? So when the bird was listed in 2014, just before that, I, I wrote 2014, but it's 2013, CPW spent a lot of effort doing aerial surveys using helicopters, surveying not only our occupied land, but a lot of our unoccupied land looking for grouse during the lecking season to see if we are missing any birds. Um, we did find one lek of five birds in the Pinion Mesa population during these efforts. And there are a few other areas where we flushed birds um, that we didn't know that we had birds. So we've done follow-up um, surveys in those areas and have not found any additional leks, but we have found areas that birds are using. We also, um, tried using aerial infrared surveys. We contracted Oahe Air Research out of Oregon. It's a specially equipped airplane that has the ability to take infrared video. 
So we tried this in 2017 in Dove Creek when that population went to zero and also in San Miguel. And you can see this is the type of image that the technician gets and they're looking for the heat signature of the grouse on the ground. All these little white dots in here are actually sage grouse. And in real time, the technician in the plane can actually zoom in and see the grouse on the ground and count them. In 2017, we had very, very um, low detection probability, even on the LEX that we knew about. So we had to go back to the drawing board and change the protocol. And we changed things around, flew at a lowered elevation earlier in the morning to see if we could find birds um, in 2019. Again, the technology just didn't work for us as it has worked very well in the western part of the greater sage grouse range. And we think two of the problems are one, our leks are so small, it is just very, very hard to find them. And then the other is the habitat types. We have a lot more um, of the shrub communities that, that have a different heat signature than just a normal sagebrush. And so once that sun hit the horizon, our habitats would just light up and it would drown out the signature of the sage grouse. So this technology did not um, provide us with uh, the results that we were hoping it would. We have also used trail cameras. We put up trail cameras on historic leks as well as areas that look like they could be suspected leks. And since we we're only able to get out there once or twice in a, during that two month period, we could easily be missing the birds. By putting these trail cameras out, we can see if birds are actually using these areas. Um, <clears throat> so that's been very helpful for us to monitor areas that we can't get to very regularly. And now there's a new project coming online. This started this spring where, um, oh, I forgot the name of the company, something birds, Thank you, Emily. Institute for Bird Populations um, is working with BLM and they're putting out these audio recording devices. Actually, they put them out before the lecking season um, in Crawford and Gunnison. And they're hoping that they'll be able to use these recordings to um, see if birds are using areas that, again, we can't get to on a regular basis. I don't have a lot of information about that, but Emily is sitting right there and she can answer any questions if you're interested. That's a, one of the um, ARDs. So I'm going to step back a little bit because you've seen the, the um, fluctuations that, that we've experienced in Gunnison sage grouse. And this is just the total range for Gunnison, the same type of um, graph as, you, as you've seen earlier, but I'm using the raw metric of high male counts because I want to compare it to what we have seen in Colorado for greater sage grouse. This is the red, the red line is greater sage grouse. It's got a different scale over on the right side of the graph. But you can see that greater sage grouse is fluctuating very similarly to Gunnison sage grouse here in Colorado. One of the differences is they might have had an actually um, a lower count, but they were able to come back. Whoa. sorry about that, um, and recover much higher. And the big question is why? What is allowing those populations to recover so much when Gunnison sage grouse aren't recovering in those potentially natural fluctuations? And that resilience is something that's really important and um, something that we should be paying attention to throughout the next couple of days in terms of where and when and how we do treatments. Now, stepping back even further, looking at greater sage grouse range wide. A recent study came out 2020, um, looking at, among other things, population estimations and trends for greater sage grouse. This study was done by um, Pete Coates and Cam and a few others here in the audience. Pete's here, Cam's here, so if you've got any questions on this, you can talk to them. Um, but I wanna point out the same type of fluctuations are occurring at, on greater sage grouse range. 
This graph, even though it's a different metric than what we've been using, you can see there's similar fluctuations over time, a downward trend. And I've circled the area that's the same years that we've been looking at for Gunnison, roughly 2000, or excuse me, 1996 to 2020. And you can see there's very, very similar fluctuations in the same, or basically the same years that we're experiencing with Gunnison and sage grouse. So this is showing that there's something bigger going on at a much larger scale than just here in Gunnison. And it's something we should be paying attention to. And I think Pete's gonna talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. So, and if you have questions, hit Pete. So everybody wants to know what's the cause of the decline and how can we fix it? Everybody wants the silver bullet and we've determined there isn't one. Everything that we're gonna be talking about in the next two days is important. Not any one single issue or conservation action is going to change and move the needle. We've been doing a ton of conservation actions as we'll see, but we might be missing the mark. And so I'm hoping that this present or this summit helps us look at the prioritize where the needs are and where the treatments fit best for Gunnison and sage grass. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip those slides and we're going to go to talking about translocation specifically. Next, Tony Apa is going to come up and talk about past translocations. Tony Apa is with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. He's in the research, the avian research unit, and he's going to talk about the past translocations that we've done focusing on survival rates. And then I'm going to come back and talk about the potential for upcoming translocations. And after that, we'll have time for questions. <laughs>